Our next PD talk is coming up on September 25th, as you can see here. It will be given by, by Jonathan Elizondo, and he's going to talk about tips and tricks to shorten the distance in online teaching. And many of us have, have participated in, in Jonathan's workshops in the past, and we know he's very good at giving us tech tips and tools and resources to really help make our online classes engaging. So it's time for us to get started. I would like to start by just explaining to any new faces that we have here what the PD Talks are. PD Talks are our professional development series offered uh, from Centro Cultural Costa Vicente Norteamericano, from the Mark Twain Library, and in conjunction with the National Conference for Teachers of English of Costa Rica. And so we do these talks once a month. They're completely free, and the purpose is to uh, have a space where we can all come together and share ideas about teaching and learning uh, English as a second or foreign language. And this pandemic situation has been a blessing in disguise because we've been able to actually reach a much larger audience and have people uh, share ideas um, that, in a way that wouldn't be possible. Matt is currently in California, even though he lives in Costa Rica. And we have people from Mexico, Salvador, all over Costa Rica, Honduras as well, I can see. Um, so. Uh, this is such a, a cool opportunity to be living in 2020 and be able to, to share with everyone these kinds of opportunities. So I want to go ahead and, and introduce our speaker so that Matt has plenty of time to, to share all the things that he has for us today. So uh, I know Matt very well, and I'm very excited that he's here with us to, to uh, share his PD talk. Matt uh, was born and raised in California, where he received his bachelor's degree in English creative writing from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. He traveled to Costa Rica where he completed his SIT TESOL certificate at the uh, Centro Espiral Mana uh, in San Carlos. And he has lived and worked there since 2014. Nowadays, he works designing curricula for public and private school systems in Costa Rica and in the Dominican Republic. And Matt earned his Master of Arts in TESOL at Marlboro College in Vermont in 2018 and his SIT TESOL trainer license in 2019. He currently works as a fellow with the Institute for Collaborative Learning, and he's here to speak to us today with the topic of tensions of project design. So please, let's give a virtual round of applause for Matt Schaefer. Take it away, Matt. Alrighty, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Mark, um, for the introduction. Thank you, Centro Cultural, um, for creating the space um, and getting the word out there and collecting our almost 100 people. I have faith we can get there. We'll rally. Um, and thank you all to taking time out of your busy weeks. Um, I know I was chatting with Mark a little bit as we were getting all the technology set up about how somehow, even though we're not going to and from work anymore, our days feel even fuller now um, with this distance work that we're doing. Uh, and I imagine all of you in your different contexts as you're adapting to the challenges and ambiguities of this wild ride of a year that we're all sharing, um, that y'all are busy too. Um, so I am thankful for you all coming together and sharing this next hour and a half. Um, and I'd like to invite you into my home here in California and my brain. Um, and hopefully we can share some ideas and talk and think and get inspired for next week and next month and next year and the future. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the tensions of project design. Um, I'm hoping we can explore some. You'll see throughout that I'm including pictures um, from my classrooms. Um, and these are from um, all my different classrooms. I've been living, as Mark said, in Costa Rica for the past five years now. Um, in March, I came here for spring break, and it's been a very long Semana Santa. Um, but before that, I'd been living full time and teaching in El Invo de Peñas Blancas and a small teacher training center called Centro Espiral Maná in Costa Rica. Um, and there, every week, I would teach students between the ages of two and 72. Um, so anywhere from preschool to elementary and high school, adults, college students, um, grandkids and their grandparents together in the same classroom. Uh, and in addition to our work um, in the classroom, um, I've also worked um, with Centro Espiramana and the Institute for Collaborative Learning, um, both doing teacher training and certification programs and some curriculum design work, too. A lot of my recent work has been trying to create the curricula and materials that are being used by public and private institutions and entire countries 
Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful to you know, share with you some of the perspectives that I've come thinking about that side of the classroom and hope that you know, my thinking with that combined with your expertise with your students and your context and classrooms um, that we can get some really cool ideas cooking. Um, so I want to share really quickly what I hope for for today um, as we share the next little over an hour together. So first, I hope that we all become inspired and excited by big ideas related to learning and teaching. Um, one of the things I try to always do whenever I'm talking to a group of teachers is have this foundation of these big ideas, ideas that relate really generally to teaching and to learning and to the human brain and the human condition. Because I know that no matter what, how we are all different, that that's something that all of us share in our roles as teachers, right? Um, now, I'm, I'm sure with the 88 people that we have, um, let me pull up the chat actually so you can see where we're at. Um, we're, oh, we're up to 109, great. So with the over 100 people we have here, I'm sure we've got close to 100 different teaching contexts. And so I wanna make sure that we have this foundation of big ideas that's something that each and every one of us can engage with. And then I also want to think about small ways that we can experiment with these ideas with our students. And I want to make sure there's a balance between those two things. Um, because if I just get up here and tell you what I did in my classrooms in 2019, there's a really good chance that that specific information isn't relevant to you and the classroom that you're going to be hosting online next week or the handout that you're gonna be sending home next month. Um, and so I wanna have some small ideas that we can connect. Um, oh, that's sweet. There's like a little girl running home from school. It's like she was doing homeschool at her neighbor's house. It's a school day, there's a kid. I saw a student in the wild, that's funny. Um, so I wanna think about the interplay between those. Um, and so if you're looking for really specific suggestions of what you can do online in your Zoom classroom on Monday, I hope to get there and have something for you. And if you're looking for really big, you know, you just want an hour on a Friday to relax and drink your cafecito and think about what the brain does with words, I hope to have a little bit of that for you too. Um, so I hope I can find something um, for everyone there. And please take care of yourselves as learners and as human beings. Um, I know one of the interesting things here is that we're all working potentially from our homes or from a space that we're sharing with people who might not necessarily be our coworkers. If you need to get up and stretch, please do. I'm at my standing desk that I've moved into and it has made this video conferencing world much more fun for me. Um, if you need to turn off your camera because you've been in teams all day and you're tired of being looked at and you feel like your hair's a little messy, like I understand that too. Um, please do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, so now I'd like to share a little bit with what's been spinning in my head recently um, in between those moments of writing some distance-based materials for the Dominican Republic and planning some trainings that we've got coming up for teachers in Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Um, these are some of the things that I've been thinking about um, and how my personal life has kind of been swirling into my professional life as I work from my room here in California. Um, so one of the things that's been spinning in my head is this. Um, these are some albums, some music that's really important to me. Um, and to share a little bit about with myself and um, maybe connect with those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting in person yet, I'm a huge music buff. Ever since I was about 12 years old, I've been collecting vinyl records. And I never brought them to Costa Rica because I was just like afraid that the humidity would just eat away at them. So I left them safely here in plastic and boxes in California. Um, but being home here, I have this great benefit of having my whole record collection. And these records that you're seeing on the screen are actually you know, things that I've been recently tracking down. One of these that I wanna talk about, this is the Beach Boys Pet Sounds. Um, this is a classic California surf rock record. It's the kind of stuff my mom would put on when she was dancing around the house. You know, good vibrations, ba, 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 good vibe. So that's one of them. Another album that's been really important to me recently is this. Um, this is Jay Dilla's Donuts. It's inter instrumental hip hop. So it's, you know, old um, R&B music and jazz that's been remixed into some beat driven dance music, but no rapping, just all melody and tone. 
Um, and then the other thing that you're seeing up on the screen there is actually a screenshot from the website SoundCloud. And another piece of music that's really important to me, if you'll see there, is, is this mashup album. Basically, this guy in the year 2003, he took this classic California beach rock album and he took this classic instrumental hip hop album and he combined them and he made a brand new piece of music. Um, it's like a mashup album and I love it. It's called In the Key of D and it's, it's one of my favorites. And recently as I was thinking, how can I explore the world from my room? I started exploring through my computer and I found that that record, which was made semi-illegally because you know he used other people's music to make a new piece of music, I found that they'd made a record. And I was like, ah, I want that. And I found that there were only 500 of them in the whole world and they were made back in 2003 when this record was released. And so I started researching. And every day I'd finish with my Zoom meetings and everything and I'd go to Google. And it took me two weeks of constant searching on the internet. But I finally found a company in Japan. They had one left. And I emailed them. I had to translate the page from Japanese to English. I purchased it. They mailed it to me. And I now have the last copy ever of this record. Now you might be asking, why have you just spent the last four minutes of my life telling me about this geeky music stuff that's not important to me? I think this record is really indicative of a lot of forces that we're dealing with as teachers in 2020. I think it captures a lot of realities of what our world is outside of the classroom and how what we're doing with our students in the classroom might be connecting with that. Um, so one of the things I'm thinking about is how this is a piece of art made by remixing or combining other pieces of art. You know, 60 years ago, art was get together with a bunch of guys, grab some guitars, jam out in the garage, and write a song about surfing. And now you can log into your computer and combine two different songs and make a piece of art that's really meaningful to someone. And so I'm thinking about how we're existing in a world where it's not just about the creation of something brand new or the holding of a specific piece of knowledge, but about synthesizing information. And whether I'm a musician or an English teacher or a, a student who's looking to graduate and go into tourism so that I can revitalize my family's business, I'm going to be thinking about how I can synthesize what's in front of me to create something new. And the other thing that has me thinking about this is this was really hard to find. I have access to the most amazing collection of information ever collected by human beings. And it took me weeks and weeks and weeks to find this. And I feel confident that this was the last one in the world. If I put a song on this on and you really like it, I'm sorry, you can't have it. This was the last one. Um, and it's a really tiny and maybe insignificant example of this, but in our world, being able to access information that might not be immediately present that might not be on that first page of Google is a very real power. If I'm looking for a new apartment in the capital city and I'm on a teacher's salary, I need to be able to know how to navigate all of the information sources available to me to find the best deal on an apartment. If I'm working on my master's degree and I think there was that one article that my teacher told me about two years ago, but I never copied it down. What was it? I need to find that for my thesis. Again, being able to use this tool in front of me to access the information I want is so important. And so I'm really thinking about how what I'm seeing in the world around me is that we're really existing at a time when accessing information and, and synthesizing what's in front of us in this incredible repository is a really powerful thing. And so I want to carry that energy of what this digital connected world is into the decisions I'm making about what my classroom is going to be. And another example of this that I think is, oh, I touched the wrong computer. Another example of this that I think is another way we can see how this is very true when it comes to learning is this story. Um, this is a book called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Um, it's uh, the biography of William Kam Kamkwamba, um, written by Brian Miller. Um, William Kamkwamba is from Malawi. And if you've never heard of this story, it's an amazing story. Um, this guy, William, was born in a very small village in Malawi. 
um, and his town was really struggling. Uh, and he found out that there was a library nearby. And William would day after day travel on foot to this library and slowly learned as much and much as he could. And he had this scientific energy about him and he started studying electricity. And everyone in his town thought he was crazy. What are you doing wasting all your time walking on, just looking at paper, what are you doing? And the next thing you know, William has built, you can see a little picture of it here. He's built a windmill and a small electric generator for his town. And he uses this access to information um, to bring electricity to his town, right? And so again, I think, this is a really interesting age. If we think about 100 years ago, we're talking about Nikola Tesla. We're talking about Thomas Edison. We're talking about people who took the absence of the concept of electricity as just lightning in the sky. And how can we make that, right? But I'd argue that to the people in his world, yeah, um, An Angeles is saying there's a movie on Netflix. If you can't find the book, if you've got Netflix, maybe it'd be a nice Friday, Friday evening. Um, we got some other solid reviews on it too. So my solid recommendation for this evening, if you don't have other plans. But for the people in William's village and his surrounding area, I would argue that he was more influential than Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla, right? He might not have been the original genesis of this concept of electricity, but he accessed information in a powerful way. He recontextualized something in a really powerful way. And so again, I'm thinking about how, yes, there are a million challenges about the fact that we're all standing at a computer right now. But I think there are also a lot of possibilities to how we can go about increasing our access to information. And the last little story I wanna tell before I get more specific and down into the nitty gritties of project-based learning is this. Um, this is actually a story, I'm pretty sure I originally heard about this at the 2017 uh, National Conference for Teachers of English at Centro Cultural. I might be mixing up years. It might have been 16 or 18. It's somewhere in there, but there was a plenary. And I remember hearing about this and I had to, again, personally go through like a week tracking down on the internet to find this. And it might actually be a different story. I don't know. But I, this amazing story of Jake Andraka, he was a teenager. He, again, very scientifically minded. On the weekends, his uncle, who worked in the science field, would take him out and they'd do experiments, testing water in the pond to find out if it was clean and things like that. Well, Jack is sitting in biology class in, uh, when he's 16, and his teacher is lecturing on something, and Jack's in the back of the classroom pretending to look at his textbook, but he's actually reading something else. I don't know if you know, I'm sure you know that trick with your students where it's like the textbook is open, but there's like another, like a cell phone is on that and they're like actually here. Well, Jack is doing this, but the distraction that he's tuning the teacher out for is an academic article um, online about pancreatic cancer. And Jack was really obsessed with this because a close family friend of his had recently passed away. And in reading what he was reading, a piece of information from the page combined with what his teacher was saying, and he got an idea. And he wrote his idea down, and he emailed it to 200 academics working in the field, right? 16-year-old kid, crazy idea in class, sends an email to 200 professors. One professor writes him back, brings him in to the lab, and they make a huge breakthrough. And I think that's a really powerful moment. Right? I think this is absolutely the outlier case of this, but you know, I, I, one of the challenges that I've been asked a lot about recently is, how do I get my kids to focus? They're staring at a screen all day, there's so many distractions and they're getting texts and WhatsApps and notifications and there's so much. And it's a very real challenge. But I also think it's important to remember that if we're existing at this age where we're seeing massive breakthroughs in these fields of art and science, come from the synthesis of information, right? Combining a piece of music from the 1960s with a piece of music from the new millennium into something brand new, or taking an idea from 150 years ago and bringing it to a new part of another continent, or combining a lecture in person with a magazine you're reading, that this synthesis of information, this almost born of the process of being distracted or having a lot of input, 
can lead to really powerful things, right? So I wanna bring all of that to the forefront to say that as teachers, as educators, how can we work with this? Because if we're going against this energy, if we're saying, don't be distracted, focus, 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 when we know that all of our students are interacting with us through these incredible multitasking machines, I feel like we're fighting the media, right? And so instead, I want to think, especially through this lens of project-based learning, how can we create space where having lots of input and watching a video while you're looking at the homework turns into something powerful for our students, right? That moves into the reality and the age that they're living in. Um, so exactly, that's, that's kind of the question that's been going on in my head. What can we do now that the most incredible collection of information ever collected in recorded history is right next to our classroom? I remember back to being in a physical class campus, right, at a school, and, you know, what it meant to be the classroom right next to the computer lab. Oh, we have the easiest access. It's easiest for us to write and sign up for the computer lab. And we're at an interesting time as teachers where for a lot of us, our classrooms are just always the computer lab, right? And so we have a lot of new work to do to come up with new ideas and new ways of being. But I know that maybe 10 years ago or so, we were all struggling because we wanted access to that computer lab. We wanted to bring that to our students. And now we have the opposite problem. The floodgates have opened up and we're all there. Um, but I think there's a lot of power and a lot of ways that we can try and see to make that work for us. So projects and tension. I'd like to start by talking about this word tension. And I've been talking a lot. Um, one, I need to drink some water. And two, I'd like to give y'all something active to engage in. With over 100 people, it's hard to just have the microphones open up because of all the feedback. Um, but I'm going to ask a few questions. And if you're feeling comfortable to wanting to share some answers in chat, um, that would be great. Um, so the first off is just this question of, of what is tension, right? Um, in this picture right here, is this an example of tension? And if so, how is this tension? Um, so if you have any thoughts on those two questions, both what is tension and is this picture right here tension? Take a moment, share anything you're thinking of in the chat. So Lord of this is saying it's the opposite of stress, right? So over here, maybe we have tension um, and stress could be something different. Okay. Ana Paola is saying that um, tension could be emotional strain. Yeah. Ah, and so Mabel also says having fun can be tension. Interesting. Uneasiness. Ooh, the, the chat's moving so fast. I've got to bring it up bigger on my screen. Um, applying a force, two points, and it's not tension. Josue, I see you're my physicist of the group. Oh, the same as stress. Okay, thanks, Lourdes. Um, and yeah, it's hard with the chat. You can't go back and fix things. But um, yeah, and, and it was interesting. I didn't want to disagree with you because there's a lot of different ideas and different ways to interpret this, right? It's language. So one example of tension right here is um, kind of in line with what Josue was saying. If we're talking about physics and science, Tension can be an example of physical force, right? In this example, we've got some students who've built a bridge and the clay over here and the clay over here are pulling this way and creating tension. And that tension is what keeps that bridge from falling, right? If those clay balls that are on the chair weren't there and they weren't stuck down, that whole bridge would have just gone poof. So that balance between being pulled to the left and then being pulled to the right that creates this tension that makes the bridge stay up so that's one example of tension um i keep doing that i have two i have, I have like six i have three actual screens in front of me and i keep hitting the wrong keyboard so a lot of you were talking about a different kind of tension and i have a picture here that might be tapping into that when you see this picture does this make you think of any different kind of tension Yes, Daphne just goes, yes, Daphne recognizes this. This, what is this? Is this the world of trying to teach out of the cloud? Look at all those tabs. This computer has to be so hot. I feel like you could turn that computer over and like fry a tortilla on it. So I see this and I see a tension between old ways of doing things and new ways of doing things, 
right? Like in the old days, you might have on your desk six different piles, one for each of your class. You put each paper in each pile and things are physically organized. And now we've got this and you're like, ah! And, and so this can create a tension inside of us because you know, we're, we're struggling with our desire for our old ways of doing things and pulls towards these new ways of doing things, right? And, and yeah, it's multitasking, but look, think about how different this kind of multitasking or this desktop looks from a desktop 10 years ago, 15, right? Inside of all of our lifetimes, what a desktop means has, has changed. And that creates tension between old and new. Is this tension? I don't know if, yes, yes, yes. We've got a lot of yeses. I thought this was a funny picture, especially for those of us who are going through quarantine, spending lots of time with loved ones. Um, I'd like to call this the tension between different perspectives, right? Oftentimes different people have different ways of seeing the world and that can create its own tension, right? Why aren't you over here looking at things the way I see them? Why aren't you over here looking at things the way I see them? And so we have all these different kinds of tension. We have tension in the physical world and tension in the digital world. We have you know, emotional tensions and tensions between people. We also have tension struggles with ourselves, right? I know my old way of doing things works, but my boss is telling me to do it this new way and I don't wanna, and that's tension. And that's kind of this mix of this internal feeling with this external force. And so I'm thinking about all of those and, you know, looking back through the chat, I think a lot of the tension that it seemed that we jumped onto was this, this emotional application. And I, I think that makes sense. We're all educators and we deal a lot more with the emotional side of the experience versus the physical engineering of the classrooms that we're in. So I think it makes sense that in this educational space, we're primed in that direction. But the one thing I do want to remember is going back to this picture of a bridge. Because when I think about the question, what is tension? Is tension a bad thing? In the case of this bridge right here, if there was no tension, there would be no bridge, right? The bridge would be on the floor. It would not be a bridge. So the tension is a necessary force to make this bridge a bridge. And so one thing I think about is if I know I can look at this physical world and see the necessity of tension and see how being pulled like this can actually create a lot of strength, it begs the question for me, where is the power? Where is the strength that comes from these other tensions, right? As I am a teacher balancing old ways of doing things and new ways of doing things, how am I doing that in a way that creates power, right? Like a bridge. Because if a bridge just goes only in one direction, it's also not a bridge, right? And if we only do the old way, well, we're not having a balance there. And if we only do new stuff, we're gonna be overwhelmed by all the new stuff. But we've gotta find this balance within ourselves and our practices of old ways of doing things and new ways of doing things. Um, balancing our own perspectives of what our classrooms should look like with the perspectives of our students and their parents and our bosses and our principals and our governments and our societies, right? There's a lot of tensions that exist for us. And I think one power too is just acknowledging them, right? If you've been in a position where you feel like your perspective as a teacher is different than your principal's perspective as an administrator, that's a tension. And there can be challenges in that. It can maybe not feel good to be pulled really, really tightly like this, but it can also create that balance. Um, and so I just wanna carry that as we think then about projects and attention that comes up when we're working with projects in the classroom. So I'm gonna present to you two statements that I've found to be true in terms of working with projects. Um, I I'm, I'm love to hear in the chat if you agree with these statements, if there's any elements in ways in which you might disagree with them, if you find something similar with you doing projects. But I have two statements I'm going to share with you that I believe are true of projects that create strong learning experiences. 
Um, and I think they pull us in different directions. So first I wanna think about them and how we might agree with these as separate pieces, but then think about how they function together to create a strong project. So the first of these statements is projects that are open-ended and can be completed in many different ways create more space for each student to shine. The more open a project is, the more paths it has, the more likely I am to have one of my students say, that's it, I'm a dancer, I will dance. Or I'm a singer, I'm gonna write a rap about the Revolutionary War. Or however it is, right? Oh, I don't wanna present in front of the whole class, but I could record a video at home and that way no one's watching me and I could edit it. And, and so having different paths creates different chances for our students to succeed. The other statement I wanna think about is, projects with clear expectations around successful completion generate fair and accurate data for assessment and feedback. I think this is important and very valid, and especially when we're working with students around that middle school, high school age, becomes really, really important, right? What are the expectations around doing a project? When you've got a teenager who's learning about authority and learning how much energy and how to balance their time with everything in their life they need and want to do. And maybe they're thinking, how fast can I finish the project for Miss Eloisa's class so I can get working on my homework for Mr. Mark's class, right? And so our students are making all of these decisions and they wanna know very clearly what our expectations are, right? And I, I think there's a tension there a tension between these two statements, because when I think about the first statement, I think that it's talking about an openness, right? Having lots of possibilities, lots of options. And I think the second, project, the second statement is more about being structured, right? And I think Tobias has is, is made a comment, I'm, I'm looking through the chats also right now, that really is capturing too where he's seeing some of this tension, that the open-endedness can be good, but it's risky, right? Because that open-endedness creates that ambiguity where then maybe when it comes to expectations, students are saying, well, does this count? Does that count? If I've got one student whose final project is going to be a video presentation and another student whose final project is going to be a poem and another student who wants their final project to be an interpretive dance, how do I make sure that each student puts the same amount of effort in and shows enough of their learning for me to be able to assess their learning, right? Like if I say, oh, my final project for the past progressive is a dance. This is, I'd like to tell you, show you what I've learned about the past progressive. Like I can do that and I can tell you that I've gone through an artistic process and that's representative of my learning, but you as the teacher are gonna have to give me a grade for that, right? Feel free to write in the chat what grade you'd give if that was my final project for showing knowledge of the past progressive. And so even though you might have a student who loves to dance, who's gonna get up there and do this, and while they're doing it, they're going to feel like a star, and maybe they will one day become a dancer or a dance therapist or a choreographer, and this is what their education needs, it also needs to fit in somehow because then the student who gets up and is like, why did I write a 12 page research paper? I want to dance. And so I, I'm feeling that tension between these two statements. And so I want to think about what we can do, thinking about these tensions, to pull them together, to make a strong project. How can we think about making, putting a lot of structure in the open-ended pathways of our projects? And how can we think about putting a lot of open-endedness in our assessment, right? How can we make our assessments more open and our open-ended projects more structured? So that's my big ideas. Remember on that yellow slide I had, I said, number one, I wanna talk about some big ideas. Now I'd like to go through with some examples from my own teaching practice and talk about how I've seen these elements come up with my students um, and some decisions and adaptations I've made along the way. Um, so that we can then start brainstorming, what can we do now moving forward with this? 
Uh, Sylvia is making a comment about how we have to have lots of roles. And I, I think it's, there's a duality there, Sylvia. I think you're talking about one thing, which is as a teacher, there's a lot of different roles I have to fill. But I also think that we as teachers are forming and helping to form our future societies. And our future societies need dancers and actors and counselors and psychologists. And our future societies need more teachers and we need electricians and we need physicists. And so the other thing I think about is how one, by me modeling all of those roles and two, by creating projects where students can explore their strengths, my students are gonna spend more time becoming experts. So that by the time Johnny is graduating from high school, he's already been editing videos for five years in projects in high school. And when he applies to university to get a video editing degree, he's already got a portfolio. And his classmate who hates technology, but loves counseling, she's got all of that time spent up where she can talk about being, you know, the, the team leader and making sure every teenager on her team was getting along and how she through a project was exploring that too. So <clears throat> how can we create different options for completing a project that has a strong structure? And how can we access our students' projects in more open ways? One quick note I want to also make, just to reiterate, um, this PowerPoint has been shared um, with Centro Cultural, and it will be uploaded online, and y'all will have access to it after today. So if I move quickly by a slide that you wanted to take a screenshot of and couldn't, um, it will get to you later, I promise. Um, and you're welcome to contact me as well, and Mark will share the link at the end. So we'll get you the materials. I know sometimes I'll be jumping to keep up with where my head's at, and I want to make sure no one's missing something. So here's one project I want to talk about. And I, I think this is a very common project in the ESL world, which is a role play. Um, it's something I've done in my class more times than I could count with every age group, every level. And it's my go-to of, oh no, I've got 10 minutes. What do we do? <laughs> you know, oh, get, get up and, and present. And so I want to share a quick story about these three students here. Um, on the left, you can see um, we've got Jimena and Sara and Elena. Um, and they're over in the hallways at Centro Espira Mana, and they're practicing and rehearsing and creating a performance. And on the right, um, that's the three of them in front of an audience of their peers in one of our classrooms, and they're sharing their presentation. And I really think these two pictures are great um, because I, I think it manages to capture on their faces a, a lot of the emotion. I look on the left, and those girls are just joyous, right? They're, they're wearing wigs, they're funny and silly, they, they're not in school, they're in a completely imaginary place, right? It's that ordinary magic that makes being a kid one of the most incredible things in the world. And that's freedom, right? And I think that context right there is where a lot of great English comes out in the classroom, because I don't see any fear in those girls. And when I walked by, I didn't hear it. They were talking, they were laughing, they were making mistakes, but they were having fun. And I heard all three of them sharing ideas and coming up with a script and really actively coming together. Even though that girl in the middle who we're gonna be focusing on today in the turquoise color, um, Sara, she's Elena's younger sister. Um, and so she's in a group with her older sister and a class of kids who are mostly older than her. But over here in the practice, they're all you know, holding their own and sharing and interacting with the group. Now, in this picture on the right, when it came time to share their work with the class, their group got up, and for the most part, Sara talked to, or sorry, Elena talked to Jimena, and Sara was quiet and off in the side. And you can see she's smiling, but she's kind of got that big nervous smile. Her feet are about two feet closer to the door than her head. She's ready to turn around and run away. And you know, I, I can tell you all of that about her because I know her as a human, right? I've seen her in my classroom and shared that space with her to know that she doesn't really like being in that position. Um, and so I'm thinking about this project and thinking about, you know, one, if my project is, okay, students, take an hour, prepare, present a presentation to our class. 
Well, there's only one way to do it, right? And if I wait to sit down in the front of the classroom with my notebook and write um, marks of who said what and how many of the vocabulary words did I hear each student do say, well, if that's my project, I'm going to sit down in that picture on the right and I'm going to see Jimena, one of the oldest students in the class. She's going to get an A. And Sara or uh, Elena is also going to get an A. She's speaking a bunch. And then I'm going to hear Sarita barely say anything. And what I do? Well, you said one word, you get a D. Um, and, and so I'm going to come back to that question. Um, I think it was Kathy, your name jumped off of my screen really quick. Katia. Um, specifically application in the future, right? The examples I'm pulling from are from my past experiences and I've just started moving online and so I don't have a ton to pull from in terms of pictures of what I'm doing right now with students. But there will be time in, in the, um, later on where we'll think forward with these ideas. Um, so bear with me. I promise there's a kernel in here that I think applies to our Zoom rooms as well. So one thing I'm thinking about here is how important it was for me to watch what was happening in the picture on the left. Because that's where I saw Sarita really shining. That's where she was being the creative one coming up with ideas for her group, right? And so even if on the surface my project just looks like it's present in front of the class, in the way that I do my assessment, right? If I'm assessing what they're presenting in front of the class, but also assessing what they're doing in their small groups and listening and doing a language analysis of how, what language they're using, talking to their peers, not with an audience. And, you know, I'm collecting some handouts that they're brainstorming handouts as we're going through and they're getting assessed and graded for all of these pieces. Now I can create a holistic picture where every student has their space to shine, right? And there's that time for Jimena to get up in front of the whole classroom and be a star and get her A right there and show that she worked for it. And there's space for Sarita to be, you know, more behind the scenes and coming up with great ideas and also show me that she's really actively engaging there. And I think Zoom works there too, right? I think, you know, these online platforms where you're creating multiple breakout rooms, I think my question would be as a teacher, okay, if I'm creating a group project, how am I facilitating, like where are my students going to work on their project, right? Am I going to ask them to have a Google Doc where they all come together and type and share ideas in the chat? Or are we gonna do it live and I put them in a Zoom breakout room, right? One of the things we facilitate as digital teachers is where are my groups convening? And so all I'm proposing is the next step of, okay, I've made my groups, they're convening, I wanna make sure my assessment includes what's going on here. So I'm gonna jump into you know, each breakout room or every day of the week, I'll go into a different breakout room and say, hey, um, I'm gonna have my microphone on mute while I'm grading papers. Um, I just wanna to listen to what's going on. It's, you know, I miss you guys, it's fun for me to hear you. And so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I just check in with a different group each day and I can be making notes so that if, if come presentation time, one student is silent, I can say, well, Marcus was speaking all week. Maybe he's sick today, right? Maybe his sister is throwing up in the background and his microphone is on mute because he's embarrassed and he doesn't want to unmute his microphone and that's why he's not. And so, you know, by creating more spaces, we're creating more space to shine. Um, so that's one project. Um, let me come up in the chat and make sure. Um, there we go. So here's another project um, that I want to share with you, thinking about those two questions that I was asking myself and y'all. This is a project that is a classic in American physics classrooms. It's called an egg drop. I don't know if you've ever heard of an egg drop, but the idea is in groups, every student group receives a raw egg and their job is to build a ship, something. I gave them a pile of plates and bowls and cups and spoons and forks and balloons and glue and paper clips and said, build a ship for your egg. And then I'm gonna throw it off the roof of our school and we're gonna see if your egg can survive. And this activity came at the end of a long month where we were working on a lot of building projects and doing vocabulary work around household objects. 
So to talk about the materials they needed to build these things, they had to use the household object vocabulary of spoon and fork and bowl and plate um, and all of that. And so one of the things that I think you can see here is in this leftmost picture, what you're seeing are in one of my classes um, from the weekend, three of the different ships that these groups built. And I think what's so cool is how different each of them look. Each group received exactly the same materials. And the path they took for how to get there is really different. And all three of these ships actually successfully protected an egg after I threw it off of a 20 foot tall building. And I think this is getting me to think about, you know, I can see here very physically, yes, Anais, this was um, from last September, um, these photos where I had our kids program going until about March. And March is when I talked with our director, Mary Scholl, and we decided that it was time to halt our in-person classes, given what we were learning about the global health situation. Um, and so again, this exact project won't work. But when I look at this picture, I think something about this project made a very clear goal of where my students were going, but left a lot of space for how to get there, right? One group did one complete thing and another group did something that looks very different. And so I wanna put that together when I'm thinking about an activity I might lead in a distance-based classroom, right? How can I make a very well-defined, um, function, right? A very well-defined objective. And it's something very physical. Protect an egg from falling. And I think in language classrooms, we're starting to see these big concepts being very central to our curricula too, right? Ask and answer questions about personal information, right? That's its own function, right? That's one step of details away from protect an egg, right? Interview a family member, and present a video about someone who you live with, right? So I, I, by, I think this project really well defined what the final project must do. Your final ship can look any way you want, but it must accomplish this, this, and this. It brings me back to our example before about the student with the 12 page research paper and the student with the interpretive dance. Now, it might be cool for me to find a way for my student to dance information about the past progressive. I don't know how you do it, but the creativity of 13 year old, they might really solidify something that they never forget for the rest of their lives going through that process. So I could potentially create space for that if I define very clearly what your final project must do, right? If there's some clause in there, like somehow your final project must contain six to 10 examples of the past progressive, well, now there's a specific function or objective for what that piece has to contain. And the student who's writing the research paper has that. And the student who's making the dance knows, here's what I might need to add on um, to, to make sure this, this reaches that. Right? And there can be more examples, right? It doesn't need to just be one thing, but by clearly defining what the final project must show or communicate, I, I think it can be a really strong way to let final projects look different. Because letting a student dance their project can be really powerful, but forcing a student to dance could just be a complete backfire. Just like forcing Sarita to stand up in front of the class and talk could completely backfire too. So an alternative to observing students in every phase of the project is define what the final project must accomplish, but not how the students are going to get there. Four, three, two, oh, the video is pretty choppy, but you can see it. Go! That was the egg. And uh, I'm with y'all. This is hard. I miss being there. Like the first month it was like, yay, my bedroom. But now it's like, I want my students. Come back to my page.
Um, okay, so the last thing I want to share with y'all um, before we move on to our next section here. These are some assessment sheets from a preschool program um, that I uh, designed and started with a coworker of mine several years ago. Um, and I think it, it's really nice artifact that talks about assessment. Um, and working in this was one of the first times I'd ever worked with preschool. And I'm going to be honest with you, the first time I started teaching preschool, I thought I was an awful teacher. I felt like a fraud. I went week after week because it was the only paying job I had at the time. But I didn't, my students, I never heard them say anything. And I've been teaching adults so much and, and used to that. Students will be able to use three to five examples of the target language to accomplish communicative tasks in an activity structure. That when I went into preschool and I was like, okay, look, happy, sad. And they were just like, I don't care. I just felt like a bad teacher. I, I was, the, what I was observing was, you're not getting anything. And six months later, I was standing out on the playground, making sure no one put anything in their mouth they shouldn't. And the only little girl in my class came up, right? One little three-year-old girl in a class of four-year-old boys. She came up and she touched me. I was like, yes. And she goes, purple. And she just pointed at el play and just went purple, green, blue. And then she walked away. This was the first time she's spoken to me in six months, right? I, I've been teaching for six months, complete silence. I'm feeling like a failure. And then all of a sudden it's there. This moment has really resonated with me. And it took me a long time to figure out what do I do with that? Like that shock I felt in that moment, how do I make that something in my teaching practice so that I'm not shocked in the future, but I'm, I'm using that as learning. And so, these assessment sheets are actually from the next preschool I worked at. And you'll see here that um, as we go through it, and it's a little bit um, low quality because of the stream, but I'll read you the categories going down. So I'm going to read through one of these. You've got three different people, and we were marking each day that we observed the behavior. So it's a strict behavioral checklist of on 11-6, did I observe Elias doing this, 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 not this. So I'm going to read those categories so you can hear them. First, talks with the teacher during structured time in Spanish. Talks with the teacher during structured time in English. Talks with their peers during structured time in Spanish. Talks with their peers during structured time in English. Then we've got the next section. Uses please and thank you in Spanish. Uses please and thank you in English. And then in the next section, talks with their teachers during free unstructured time Spanish. And then we've got teachers and peers in Spanish and English in unstructured time too. Um, and then at the very bottom, shows understanding of instructions in Spanish, shows understanding of instructions in English. And so I think this is a, a solid example at a different age of another way that we can open up our assessment, right? I think one of the traps that project-based learning sets us up for is we get these amazing projects, right? Our students pour their time and their heart into something that's truly incredible. And we just get obsessed with like, wow, that I just want to give this the grade because it's, but there's so much behind a project, right? There's so much more. And so we've got to make sure that even though we put all this thought into what is the final outcome of this project, what are my students creating that when it comes time to assess we have these really diverse ways of assessing what's going on because that little girl i was telling you the story about her sheet she wouldn't have had a single check in the top box during structured time she didn't speak now i don't know why because i can't read her mind i would theorize it's because she's younger than all the other students she recognizes that she's the only girl in the group and she's still coming to understand what, what gender is and who she is and how that might be affecting her. You know, there, there's so many reasons that could be at play as to why she is. She's just personally a very shy person who doesn't like talking in front of people. I could list reasons all day. It's not important for me to understand why, but to give her a space to show me that she's learned, right? 
I think once I started observing my preschoolers like this, I felt like a detective, right? I felt like, okay, I'm at the school. How can I find as many opportunities today that Elias is going to impress me with his Spanish and his English and all of his language in general? So that next week in my parent teacher conference, I can brag about him to his mom, right? And let me go over here and I'm gonna walk by the play and oh yeah, I'm gonna walk by and put this ball away too. And really I'm doing observe observation of recess because they might be speaking English, right? And maybe for you in your Zoom class, you've got your students just chit chatting for 10 minutes and you're just like, okay, as long as the conversation's appropriate, we're gonna start up again at 3.10 you can chat with your your classmates until we're there and maybe you're not actively participating but you could still be noting you know wow said you just made a really funny joke in english i'm gonna i'm gonna throw that into his participation for the day you know oh wow marcus just asked rebecca to explain the homework and yeah they were talking in spanish but i heard rebecca basically explain the present progressive to marcus amazingly there's rebecca's participation for the day and so i, I think that's the challenge is that I've spent so much time in a classroom that when I have to be the detective and go to the playground and go to the lunch tables and go to the one-on-one -on -one table and go to the group setting to make all of these assessments here, I think the question that we're all wondering around and that ambiguity is, in a digital classroom, where are all those spaces, right? How can I structure these things so that when my students are coming together to collaborate on a Google Doc, I have access to that Google Doc so I can log in and scan it and go, ah, oh, yeah, I can see that this, this, and this student participated today. There's your check, right? How can we structure these moments so that in all of the different digital spaces where our classrooms are happening, we can enter into that space and gather some ideas? How can we give college students their space, guide them, and assess them at the same time? Um, Daphne, I think that's a really interesting question. My personal experience is I feel like there was a big jump from high school to college, but there was a jump nonetheless. Then in high school, I had teachers who reminded me and they wrote the homework on the board and they're like, now remember your essays due tomorrow and they tell you every day of the week. That was at least my personal experience, right? I was still legally a child. And so my teacher, even though I thought I was 17 and knew everything in the world, was in charge of a child. And in college, we really typically cross that 18 line. And whether it's an 18 year old student or a non-traditional student that's older, most of the college population is above that and they're legally adults. So I think one, that is a difference there. And two, I also see this big transition from that two year old I was just talking about who she might've needed me to put her shoes on one day Right? Well, that two-year-old has grown up now and become a college student and is preparing to go off and get a job working. And so I need to make sure that the amount of structure and support I put in terms of my students are graded towards where they are. So my big thinking initially in terms of how to apply this to college students is that college students can deal with more ambiguity. Right? A college student is getting to that level of cognition where you can say, your project can be in a PowerPoint form, a website, a blog, a Word document, um, a Prezi, whatever it is, my thinking is you should spend about 10 hours working on this project. Now, a 20-year-old might be able to budget their time, plan out the budget of a 10-hour project, and follow that timeline and finish. And maybe they say, well, I didn't get that last slide done, but I'm about to hit my 10 hours. And that's an important skill on the job, right? That's the soft skill that a 20 year old needs. That might be too much challenge for a 12 year old. Your 12 year old might start drawing their first slide and spend 10 hours drawing and finish and go, teacher said 10 hours, I'm done. So when I'm thinking about college students, I'm thinking they have a little bit more maturity and they also have a greater tolerance for ambiguity. And so both of those things mean I can give a, a slightly more open project description and have my students rise to and meet that. Because a 20 year old, if a 20 year old comes into your classroom and does this, 
and says, yeah, bro, if that took me 10 hours, you look at them and you're like, we're two adults here. Like you, I know you're lying and you know you're lying. So I'm going to give you the grade that has earned and you're going to actually do the next project if you'd like to pass my class, right? Whereas a 13 year old, that could create a friction that lasts the rest of the year because where they're coming at emotionally is just, they can't maybe handle at 13 being told you didn't do it. So you're not getting credit for not doing it, right? So that's where I'm thinking out in terms of how to come up to college with this. Um, whereas you see in the preschool, I'm getting hyper specific, right? And then it's a spectrum where with the college kids, I think we can just open it up more. I think adults too, um, right? Just once the brain becomes able to self-regulate as its own strong skill, then I think as teachers, we want to empower our students to practice self-regulation because I don't know if they're going to need English at every job they go to, but I know the ability to manage their own time and get a project done on a timeline is going to help them at every job they go to. Um, so that's the other thing too. I think these things that make for strong projects oftentimes are soft skills that if I think about the modern employment market, these are the soft skills that employers are hiring. And so I think that's another way that I can reflect back on my projects and go, does this project, like, you know, yes, it's about English. Yes, maybe the vocabulary. I'm talking about vacations because that's the unit we're in. But is this the kind of thing that one of these kids could grow up and do at their job? Like, you know, write a brochure for a company? Like, okay, yeah. Like, so I'm, I'm starting to see myself moving in a direction where the soft skills as well as the content are all serving my students in their learning. Planning process with college students. Zoom discussions. Yeah, and I, like, I, I think too, there's like a lot of space to move in terms of self-reflection there, right? Like, I, I think one, one of the really strong things to develop, like I remember in college at one point, our teacher gave us like halfway through a project, we had to give an evaluation to every other member of our group, including ourselves. How much effort have you been doing? What are the things you've accomplished so far, right? And that's its own skill. Me working at my institution, I need to know what Roger and Nico and Laura and Chad are working on in Alajuela. I need to know what Mary and Yvonne are working at in El Inbu. I need to know what I'm working at in California. I need to know what's going on in offices in both San Jose and Santo Domingo. And so me managing information across a project is important. And so with a college student or an adult to get more into that reflection and say, okay, you've been working in this project team for a week. Today, at the very end of the class, I'm going to send you out a link to a Google survey online. And I want you to really quick, just give an evaluation to each of your team members. The reason why I'm suggesting this for college kids is I think it takes an incredible amount of emotional maturity and it's its own skill to give feedback that is professional and not personal, right? To not just say, oh, I'm giving this person one star because I don't like them. And I think more of those emotional intelligence challenges come up with younger students where you're getting bad peer evaluations because so-and-so broke up with so-and-so and is now dating so-and-so. So I think that's another strategy that as students are getting older and more emotionally mature that it can give you observation into how the group is working, as well as let the student develop a skill that they need to have in 2020 and beyond. Um, so here are some of my big takeaways. Thinking about those three examples, what are some answers that I have to these questions? And not that these are the only three answers. I think big questions have lots of answers. So these are three of my answers to these questions that I continue considering. In terms of how we can create different options for completing a project that has a strong structure, I think the first can be allow the student a choice of several mediums. In person, that could be a presentation or a video or a poster. And online, it could be different digital platforms, different ways of sharing, right? Are they going to all 
share live via Zoom? Are they going to upload their final projects to a Google Drive and do a gallery walk around the Google Drive? For each medium, have a clear rubric or assessment checklist. And again, I, I think it could be different rubrics, or maybe you have, this is the core rubric, and then if the student chooses to do a video, this is the additional chart for video. If the student to do is to do brochure, there's one more row for brochure. And if they choose to do a website, there's one more row for a website, right? So every student knows I'm getting assessed on this, these four. And if I choose to do a website, also this one, right? And I think that gives me a way to express, okay, if you do a website, here's what I'm looking for. And if you do a written piece, here's what I'm looking for. Um, and when possible, provide a model for each medium. Again, I think that's going to be more tricky right now because that folder or box you have hiding in a closet that your family keeps trying to get you to throw away. That's like every student presentation and project you've collected over the last 20 years. So you can be like, here's a sample of this. They might not have been made in a Zoom classroom. So it's harder to go to that box and pull out and say, oh, look, here's a Prezi that my student made in 1974 because and I, I know Sandra, I know, because I'm a teacher and I've got that box in my closet too. It's that class that we never talk about that we all took in our master's programs where they told us all those crazy things that we do as teachers and we're all the same. But, um, <clears throat> so it might be hard to find a model for all the different projects right now because we're inventing brand new projects. So with that one, I just wanna say, if you can't do it because you're inventing a brand new project, okay. Give yourself permission to not do that and say, okay, I'll try it. And if the project works, I've got a model for next semester or for next month's project. Let me check the chat. Do they have any questions? Okay. So in terms of making our assessments more open, here are my three big takeaways. First, assess students as they're completing the project, right? This statement right here, even though it seems pretty simple and it's probably something that we were doing in our classrooms, whether we called it this or not, for me, this is the foundation of formative assessment. If I'm assessing students for the entire period of time that the project is being completed and presented, exactly, Tobias, I'm looking at the process of learning, not just the product. And that whole distinction of product versus process, to me, that comes back to this remix album, right? 50 years ago, the concept of what it means to make art is I have gone to silence and made something out of nothing. And today that's different, right? Today, accessing something and remixing it and recontextualizing it can be its own type of presentation, its own type of creation and collaboration. Um, and, and so to get that whole process, right? Remember, it's not just about the product, it's about seeing how the student got there. Because a lot of times that moment of brilliance happens during the creative process. We wanna make sure as teachers we capture that. And then we wanna make sure we're creating assessment tools that push us towards collecting that information. Um, and, and, and celebrating students. And I, I think there's another really strong power here too. I remember uh, one of my professors telling me that he had a habit of giving students three points for writing their name on a quiz. And I heard that and thought, well, that seems silly. Why would you do that? Like, if you give every student three points for writing their name on every quiz, Mathematically, it's the exact same thing as giving no students no points for writing their name. It's, it's exactly the same. And he goes, well, that way, every student starts with three points. The first thing they do on a quiz is no, Josh just gave me three points. And he was like, that's a really powerful thing, right? I want my students to know from step one that I'm on their side. I'm not here to be the wall saying you don't know English. I'm here being the teacher helping you over the wall of learning, saying that was it, and that was good, and that was good, right? 
Sometimes my students need me to point out when they were missing commas. But most of the time, I'm trying to find every moment to celebrate, to give my student energy so I can boost them up and keep their learning going. And another idea, and I'm gonna talk about this more as we go on um, and talk a little bit more about models. Have your students use the assessment tool to grade a model. So I wanna get into thinking about um, some models too. Um, and thinking too, how and when does feedback support students in completing a project? Um, oh, my computer is catching up to me, there we go. So this was a flashback to that month where we were building our egg drops. And that picture on the right is Mariangel assembling her group's final egg drop that successfully presented pr or protected an egg. Now on the very left, you can see her in a white shirt with a rainbow on it. That's also Mariangel. And she is trying to build a tower with her teammates. And you can see their tower is they took a toothpick and they put some clay and then they put a toothpick and a toothpick and a toothpick and a toothpick. And when they stood it up, it did this. Because of course it was just a bunch of toothpicks in a straight line. Well, after that class, I said, okay, students, I'm gonna take the exact same materials I gave you and I'm gonna build my tower. And I built the tower in the center. I, having studied physics, used triangles. I built a triangle here and a triangle here and a triangle here and that made a very strong structure all the way to the top. And I had them all grab the table and shake it. No one could shake it down. And I had them blow really hard. That was never gonna bring it down. But you know, sometimes you just gotta let the kids believe they could blow it over. But that was the feedback I gave them. I never said you did it wrong or I did it right. I just showed them, here's how I do it. And here's how strong it is. Two weeks later, I want you to zoom back in on this photo with Marty on Hill. Can I, I don't think I can bring my mic up. My, oh, there it is. Look at here. See this and this. Marty Angel has her toothpicks making triangles. So I think that's, and I wanna show this, and I don't wanna tell this story to be like, wow, look, I did something amazing as a teacher, celebrate me. I think what was right here was the moment the feedback came. At a moment when a student was feeling struggle because their tower didn't work, they got a really subtle suggestion of a different way to do something. I never told them they were wrong. I never competed against them and said, I win, you lose, nah, nah, nah. And because it came when Marty Angel was thinking, hmm, I'm frustrated. I wanted to build a tower and it didn't work. When she saw that, she was ready to learn. And she did. And so I think as we're thinking about projects, there's a really powerful way we're getting our students to interact with models along the way can be really powerful, right? I, I didn't lecture about physics. I didn't show diagrams or a science video on YouTube. I just showed them the tower and said, try to knock it over. And they realized, wow, Matt's tower is way stronger than mine. And so I think, you know, if a student is working to create a news broadcast, Maybe on Wednesday, I find a funny video of someone on YouTube doing the news, and that's our warm up activity, right? Where along the process am I giving these inspirational pieces of feedback, right? Showing my students what could be done. I wanna talk really quickly about modals, and I know we're sneaking up on the end, and I wanna make sure there's also a time to go in for some questions and. If y'all wanna be raising your hand and unmuting your mics, I wanna save about 10 or so minutes for that. Um, so I'm gonna jump really quick through this in about five minutes or so. And then if you have questions, hold on to them tight and I'd love to hear from y'all. So I wanna talk about using modal models modally. Using models modally. Modally just means in different ways. And I like how hard that is to say. I like the model modally. So, I wanna to present to you three different ways that I'm thinking about using models in my project right now. One thing I'm thinking about is when I'm trying to come up with what could our project be? One tip I wanna give you, look to your curriculum for ideas. If in weeks one, two, and three, your students in studying weather were doing interviews, making posters about the weather, um, maybe 
coming up with, oh, this was the interview and this was the weather forecast. If these are the type of things they've done in small controlled settings, how could we take each of these projects and move them up to the next level, right? Oh, as a part of this unit, my student has already interviewed someone they know. How could I invite my student to interview a student from another classroom? Or maybe I have a teacher I know who works at a different school and we set up online pen pals and our student has to interview someone they don't know. And that's the next step up. They take something they already did in the curriculum. And so then it's like saying, oh, this is round two. By having your project be a complication of something they've already done, your students have already practiced a little bit. Even though they didn't know it, week two was a model preparing them for what this final project could look like. Likewise, maybe one of the weeks, and this is all stuff I've pulled out of the, um, the new MEP curricula. So if you're working in a um, public school in Costa Rica, this is directly from that. But I think this is a process that anyone can do, right? I see here a poster about the weather and I could say, oh, um, I want to task you with making an infographic that could be shared on social media about what to wear in different regions of Costa Rica, right? So they've already done a simple version one week and now they're doing a more complex version. That process to me really taps into the zone of proximal development. During instruction time, my students do something to a certain level. And when it comes project time, I have them do the same thing, but a little bit harder and maybe in a group or on their own, right? So the project gets a little bit harder and the working context gets a little bit harder. So that's tip number one. Tip number two, there we go. Have your students grade the models. Again, I think there's a challenge because we might not have models, but if you take the time to make a rubric, um, I, I think this can work really awesome and even outside of straight projects, but I think about one of my favorite activities to do in teaching how to write a five paragraph essay. I give my students an essay that I wrote when I was in high school and I give them the same rubric that I would use with them and I have them give me a grade. And I think going through that process is such a strong way for a student to get really clear on the instructions, right? If I explain a project and say, any questions? Silence. But when I do this project with my students and I give them my essay and say, give me a grade, this, these are the moments when I hear them five minutes in going, oh, SOS and thesis statement right? The moment when they had to give me a score for it, that's when it clicked. I think this activity can also help if you're dealing with teenagers who struggle emotionally with grades they're not happy with. That's my very compassionate and understanding way of saying that context and when a student receives their grade and says, Pero ve, ese no es justo. Yo trae tanto en eso. No, no quería ese mark. ¿Qué puedo hacer para cambiar eso? And they don't feel, like, they don't like that grade, and they don't feel it's a connection, and they blame you. Ah, me dio ese marca porque me cae mal, no me gusta, porque está celoso que mi, mi iPhone es más nuevo que el suyo. Right? And as soon as our students are in that mode, as soon as they get emotionally defensive with us, the feedback isn't helping them learn. Right? That grade on that test has just put them into, yo soy la reina y ese profe no sabe nada el otro año, tengo mejor oportunidad, right? As soon as that wall goes up, we're done. And I think this activity is one way to kind of preeminently get there, right? Because that student, you've seen, a teenager is really good at telling you, no, this paper I wrote, 100%. It's absolutely 100%. So before getting to that moment, have them give out a grade to a paper that you know might not be perfect, but is all right. So they can say, eh, and, and then maybe two classmates are disagreeing. I think it's a three, I think it's a four. But they get a really strong sense of what the rubric means and what the project means. Um, I think it's a really powerful way to get your students self-reflecting. 
I think a student who uses a rubric to grade an essay they didn't wrote, write is going to be thinking about that as they're writing. They're going to be looking at their paper before they hit submit and thinking, is this really as good as that paper I read? And my last tip about modals is use modals as cyclical feedback. And this is the story I already told you, um, where I did a month of construction projects where my students were focusing on the vocabulary of household objects. Every week I gave them a new construction task using the same objects. And every week after they did the task, then I showed them how I would do it, right? So I never took time out of my classroom to lecture about physics. I wanted to, I love physics. It's my favorite science, but I'm limited in terms of time and it's an English class. So I know my students need some interaction with engineering ideas to feel successful at this project, right? I know I need to support my students with that skill, but I also need to balance time and be effective with it. And so that was my way of getting around that by just showing my students and letting them learn these things through just observation. Here's what made my tower tall. Here's what made my bridge strong. Here's what made my boat float. And time and time again, I saw those students taking those ideas in on their own. Um, so I thought, especially when we're working with projects, a lot of times the best feedback we can give is letting a student see a different kind of project and seeing how someone else might interpret it. Um, a lot of times that can give, create that space for self-reflection. So, a quote, the scientist is not a person who gives the right answers, they're the ones who asks the right questions. Um, I know we have you all on mute. If you'd like to type any questions you have at this point in the chat, um, I'll be watching there. If you wanna come on, um, if you can raise your hand in Zoom, if you click on um, participants and find your own name, um, you can raise your hand um, and we can be watching in chat and try to unmute people one at a time too if you wanna ask a question, but yeah, I've been yeah, talking we can for help a while you with that. Mm -hmm. and I'm a little out of water, so. Please, if you have any thoughts you want to share with the group, I'm open. Thank you, Matt. Yes, guys, uh, go ahead and write your questions there. Or if you prefer just to make a comment or a question in person, like Matt said, find out how to raise your hand. We have one already from Mirna. So <clears throat> yeah. Mirna, I'm, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you should now have the ability to unmute yourself. Hello there, I'm Mirna. Um, uh, I'm, I'm in charge of uh, Escuela Normal Superior here in Mexico, and we are here in charge of the future teachers of English. Mm -hmm. And I just love your ideas, okay? Mm -hmm. I love the way you show us the difference of working with project-based and how we can do it. I really would like to congratulate you in Centro Espiral Mana. I was a student there also, and I love it and my best regards, and thank you so much for sharing with us. I just wanted to appreciate your talk. Oh, well, thank you so much for the positive feedback. That really means a lot to me. Shout out to you and all of our alumni. Big spiral of love going out to all of y'all. Um, so thank you. Um, and I also, I saw a question come up um, in chat uh, from Carla. Carla asks, um, that she, um, she says, I know we not only have to focus on the result of the project, but on the process as well. So me having 40 minute, minutes on Zoom and six full topics to teach in four weeks before exam, do I need to spend my synchronous time with them working on their projects? Is that really necessary? If not, how can I access a project that I cannot see? <sighs> Carla, the reason I read your, um, your question like that is because I'm hearing a lot of that tension around limited time that I think is really common in all types of teaching, right? So the type of question you're asking me gets me in this mindset where I'm I'm in that rush teacher mode where I'm trying to cover all the content and trying to squeeze everything into 40 minutes. And so instead of answering your question, I wanna offer you a different question. It seems like what I'm observing from the little you've shared with about your context that you're struggling to find enough time to do everything you can. So my curiosity would be, how can you collect evidence of your students' project work outside of the classroom and outside of those 40 minutes. Because either way I'm saying, 
let's invent some way to observe their process that we might not already be doing. So we're already coming up with a new strategy. So if I know that I'm already limited on my classroom time, my in invitation for you is to experiment and try to do something outside of the classroom. I don't know what age your students are, but what if, let's say you're working on a project over a month, and maybe one of the things you have your students do every week on Friday, you send out a link to a Google survey, and the survey is just like my name, the day, an open paragraph, what did I do on my project this week? And then an optional, que preguntas tengo para maestro? Right? And every week I just have my students fill that out. Right? And I say, okay, I want you to know this survey I'm going to send you out on Friday. Um, every week there's going to be five participation points available for you. If you submit the survey, you get one point. Um, and if, and, and then, you know, and come up with a system and specifically a rubric for how you're going to be assigning those points. But that would be my answer. If, if you know you're struggling on time, then take advantage of the fact that we now get to decide between synchronous and non-synchronous classes and find a way to get data from non-synchronous time. Someone asked for an email. I'm going to type my email in the chat right now. Here you go, Sylvia et al. Does anyone else have any questions? I haven't been looking in the participants list. To see a lot if we of have positive any feedback, Matt. We uh, haven't got any questions yet. Uh, I see Ann Porras is asking, so I worry that showing a model will limit students' imagination uh, and that they might think that they have to imitate the model. So what has been your yeah. experience with that? Yeah, I, I think that's like, it's such a strong, strong thing. Um, there's a really strong kernel that comes out of the critical response process, um, which is this amazing dancer, Liz Lerman, talking about receiving feedback. And she said that when someone said, oh, why don't you just change your costume and make it red? She hated that because either they were wrong and they didn't get the piece or they were right. And she felt like that stole her artistry, right? So I think there is always a challenge in terms of does showing a model limit the creative output, right? Or create this, I can't, I can't compete against that. So I have two suggestions around that. One, if the model that you're showing is so, so close to exactly what you think the students are going to be doing, to me, it sounds like the project itself isn't open enough. If there's really only one way to do it, then there's not an open project. Right? So if seeing one model kind of spoils it, like I know in one of my um, social studies classes, we had to design a vehicle to get across the Sahara Desert. And our teacher gave us a list of requirements and we had to draw out a picture and list out every bit of our vehicle. The secret was the answer is a camel. A camel has everything you need to cross the Sahara Desert. It's better than any car you can design. And as soon as we saw that model, as soon as an eighth grader told me, it's a camel, then I didn't do the project. So I think it's possible, but I think it's only possible if you have a really narrow project. So my first invitation to that question would be, how could we make the project bigger, right? Okay, here's an example of what it looks like if you make a physical poster. But I also wanna invite you to make a digital poster. And maybe you don't show a digital poster. So if you have a student who really needs open space to be creative, they're like, I can't do physical, teacher showed me, that's boring, I'm doing digital. And if you have a student who needs everything spelled out, they can say, I'm going to make a poster that looks exactly like the poster my teacher showed me, right? Like those are different types of the creative process that different students can do. Um, uh, so that's one. The other um, suggestion I would make is choose models from a level that's student appropriate. I think one of the most powerful things that my poetry professor did in university, um, uh, Cecilia Wallach, the woman I credit with making me fall in love with poetry, she read us, every time she'd walk into class, she'd start reciting a poem. And sometimes it was a famous dead poet that we felt guilty for not knowing. 
Sometimes it was her own poem that she wrote that was also amazing because she was a very famous poet. And sometimes it was a poem written by a nine-year-old in a poetry workshop she led in uh, an under-resourced school in the city. And the way she mixed those models together, I got to learn to appreciate everything as poetry. It didn't matter if a nine-year-old wrote it or Pablo Neruda wrote it. If there was beauty and truth to it, it was poetry. And so I think if every model I show to my students is a professional newscaster who does this for a job, it could be really intimidating. But if I go on YouTube and just search like ESL student weather presentation and show them something I find on the internet from another classroom that's like an amateur product, I think that can also create less of that comparison tension where I'm not as good as the model. So I see Mark change the slide and we hit 430. So that's what I have for that question now. Hope that helps. Mark, if you want to well, uh, take it away. Yes, thank you so much, Matt. Um, as you've got plenty of positive feedback there in the in the comments, but uh, definitely want to take uh, in a moment to officially thank you for donating your time and, and your energy and ideas here with us today. So everyone, please uh, join us with uh, a show of hands um, in some way to, to express your gratitude to Matt for his time. So um, we'll keep the room open for another moment uh, just for you to say goodbye, but we want to say thank you so much from Central Cultural Cultural Centro North Americano, and we hope to see you in the next PD Talk. Have a wonderful afternoon and a great weekend. Thanks, everyone.